Welcome to Woodland Valley Church. Glad you can join us tonight in our journey through the book of Revelation. If you'd like to follow along, you can look at our website, www.woodlandvalley.org. You can download material and you can walk with us through the book of Revelation. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are incredible. Father, you are the revealer of mysteries. You are the, uh, the, the, the way, the truth, and the life. You know all there is. Nothing ever occurs to you. And Father, we come before you tonight at the beginning of the study, and we ask that you would uh, uh, guide us into understanding. Help us, Father, as we dig into this book, help us to understand what it is that you, the message that you have for us, that we can apply to our lives. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would guide our discussion. I ask that it would all be done to your glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, welcome. We're going to get started here. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of Revelation, and, and I, got, uh, I got a little outline for you here. Uh, that's right at the beginning of your notes. They're also at the back of your notes, and it's just kind of a, just kind of a picture. It kind of takes the chapters, 1 through 21, and it gives you the 16 visions, and it breaks that up so you can kind of see uh, where you are. One of the difficult things about the book of Revelation is it's not necessarily chronological. Okay, there are times when uh, uh, the Lord is referring back to eternity past. There are some times when he's referring to eternity future. Sometimes he's referring to the creation week. Sometimes he's referring to... It, it's not your typical nice cute little storybook where it starts here and it goes chronologically through order. So I don't know about you, but sometimes for me, I can get a little mixed up with that. Okay, so um, this, I, I put this in here so you can kind of get an idea of where we're at. So if we end up, if we're in, let's say we're in chapter 7, you know we're at the, fir the fourth vision, we're in the scrolls, okay? You go down here and you can see the breakup uh, of where you are. I begin to talk about the 144,000, so on and so forth. So it's a good panoramic view of Revelation, okay? Speaking of which, the word Revelation comes from the word apocalypsis, and it means a dec uh, disclosure or an unveiling. Uh, Revelation... Um, God doesn't want us necessarily, he's not, the, he's not the author of confusion. So God does not say, hey, um, I'm going to throw some mysteries out there to the people and let them flounder without any knowledge. He, he wants us to understand. He wants us to know uh, uh, what his plan is. It's a disclosure, an unveiling. It's where we get our word apocalypse. Apocalypse simply means a disclosure. An, an unveiling of a mystery something that was not necessarily known, but that is known. And we'll talk about that when we, when we get a little bit further in. Uh, Daniel, when Daniel was given a vision of the future, of the, end, of the end of times, he is told at a certain point to seal it up. Do not reveal it yet. And we believe some of that is then revealed here by John. Some of it is yet to be revealed in heaven. Okay, but we'll, we'll get there. Uh, as to the author... Uh, we believe that it's the, uh, the author is John the Apostle. Um, he, uh, he calls himself John, first of all, but there are a number of Johns in Scripture. So when you're looking at the author, you're trying to find other modes to figure out, well, well how, who is he? How do we know? Um, he calls himself that, but he also uses some very similar words that he used in both his gospel and his epistles. Okay? And... People who study literature will say, okay, let's find, if, let's find out where there are some similarities in writing style. Now remember, this is in apocalyptic language. Very picturesque. Very, um, a lot of examples, a lot of visions. And, and the Gospels weren't like that, and neither were the epistles. Okay? But we do see there's a lot of words that are very, very similar, and that's how people will track hey, oh, he, so this is the author, not John Mark. This is John the Apostle. So uh, we believe that, that uh, it was uh, John the Apostle. And most Bible students um, will, will subscribe to that. Uh, John had three different kinds of literature, as we just talked about. Um, we got the Gospel of John, we got John's epistles, and we got uh, the, uh, uh, the Revelation of Christ. And each one has kind of a different purpose. Okay? Uh, John writes... Uh, um, each one and, and kind of says, hey, this is, the, this is what these books are about. Very, very different, but there's a, uh, um, there's a link in all of them. 
that leads us to believe John wrote all three, not just some other John, not a different leader in the church. This is actually John the Apostle. Okay? Uh, this is uh, um, a chart, by the way. I don't know if you, you're familiar with Warren Worsby. Warren Worsby um, came up with this chart. It's a, it's, a, it's a pretty neat chart. It kind of gives you an idea of who he is, uh, what's going on with these three different books. Okay? Um, purpose. Purpose of this book is to reveal Jesus Christ. Here's the deal. The Bible, from cover to cover, is an unveiling of Christ and his interaction with us. His, uh, um, his person, his purpose, and his, uh, his plan for, for each and every one of us. Um, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, tells us, uh, the revel as a matter of fact, I think I even have that up there. Yeah. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which shortly must come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. All of Scripture is about Jesus Christ. So when you really want to get that, I mean, specifics are, are, are you can get very specific. But when you look at Genesis, what's it about? It's about the unveiling of Christ, God himself. You look at Isaiah, what is it? Unveiling of Christ. You go all the way to the gospel, same thing. All the way through the Bible, the Bible is God's book. It's about him, okay? And it tells us his person, it tells us about his person, his power, and his plan for all of creation, okay? That is uh, the purpose of this book. Uh, people will get kind of bogged down with the book of Revelation, um, because they'll lose this. If, if we can, you know, when you're driving down the road, now how many of you have been, you ever been driving down the road and you, um, you hit a fog bank? It gets really, really foggy, and, you know, you're, you're, you're having trouble finding out where you are, but you, you know the road, and what do you typically do? You typically look to the, to the side of the road, to the corner of the road, so that you know where you are, and you, you slow way down, but that's kind of your guide. You follow that guide till you get out of, the, out of the fog bank. Same thing. Here's the guide. We're going to get into some pretty heavy stuff in the book of Revelation. But we're always going to go back to it's Christ and Christ alone. Okay, it's all about an unveiling of who he is. Okay, as for the date and origin, a lot of, um, there used to be a lot of argument about this. But... Uh, in, in, uh, as, as we've learned more and as we've done more research, it looks like it was written somewhere between A.D. 81 and A.D. 96. Uh, traditional view says that it was during the reign of Domitian, Emperor Domitian, uh, which is during this time period. Okay? The early church fathers and, and schol most scholars have since agreed with this, but there are different opinions about that. Okay? Uh, it's likely that John wrote this uh, letter, this revelation, while during his exile on the island of Patmos. And we know historically he was on Patmos during this time period for sure. Okay? There's speculation about whether or not he was there earlier. Some of the um, opposition to this would be, well, if the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, certainly John would have mentioned that in his writing if it was after. Not necessarily. John's purpose of this book was not to let people know what had happened to the temple in Jerusalem. It was picturing the temple that was going to take place in the end time. So there's, there's some question about this, but that, those questions have kind of fallen a little bit by the wayside as time has gone on here. Okay, and we believe that he was uh, on the island of Patmos. Uh, it was, uh, the island of Patmos was a, was a penal colony. It was a, it was a prison colony. And he was there because of his witness of Jesus Christ. Okay, um, let's take a look at some of the ideas, uh, key ideas of the book. Uh, he says, one of the big aspects, two big aspects, I am coming soon, you're going to hear this a couple of times, and judgment. I am coming soon, and judgment. In between, um, uh, the book deals with a vivid description of uh, um, God's judgment. I am coming soon. He mentions it in chapter 1. He mentions it in chapter 22. Okay, so he starts off the book with, hey, I'm coming soon. He ends the book with, hey, I'm coming soon. 
all the way through between them is God's, uh, the, the, the unveiling of his judgment upon his creation. Okay, key verse, huge, huge uh, help here is Revelation 119. Now you, as with any, any book of the Bible, you can pick a number of key verses. But this one is the one that help, gives us kind of an outline to the book itself. What does he say? He says, therefore, write the things, he's talking to John, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. So he's giving us a basic chronology, and we're going to look at how that maps out. Okay, he's, So John's going to be talking about things that did take place. This is one of them, him, him being exposed to Christ uh, in his glorified state. Okay, There are going to be other times when he's going to refer back to previous um, events in, in Bible history. He's also going to write, uh, the things which are. So, John, here you are right now. This is what's going on right now. I want you to read it. And God does that. We're going to see God puts markers in the book of Revelation to let us know where and when he's speaking about. And we'll keep on all of those. And, obviously, because it's, it's uh, prophecy, the things which will, uh, will take place. Okay? Here's some key words that we're going to be looking at. Lamb, the word lamb, 29 times. Interestingly enough, the other word, big word here is throne. Lamb, submission, throne, rulership, or sovereign. He gives both. Christ is uh, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, but he's also the judge of all things. Okay? Also, numbers factor very, very prominently in this book. Uh, the, number seven, 55 times. And we're going to look at some of those and why they're significant. Now, I'm not going to go down the uh, numerology road and say this number means this or that. Yeah, we're going to look at, we're going to see some cases we're told what, those, what the numbers mean. Some cases we're not. But I've been in, I've been in, I did some research where people can get really far out on these things. And they'll, they'll read into the numbers something that wasn't really meant to be read into. Okay. Number four. Uh, occurs 29 times, number 12, 23, and number 10 uh, uh, comes up um, nine times. Now, there are some dangers in studying the book of Revelation. Okay, and we're going to try to avoid these dangers. The first danger is the danger of sensationalism. We don't have to make the book of Revelation any more exciting than it already is. It takes care of that itself. Okay, we don't have to attribute to it meanings just to make it fantastic. It is an incredibly fantastic book. Uh, so we are going to avoid that. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 says this, for, when the time, uh, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. We live in the Hollywood age today where everything has got to be better than last year and excitement and dynamic and take my breath away and, and, and unfortunately people have done that with God's word. God's word is, is, is the most exciting book in all existence. We don't have to make it something that it's not. So we're not going to sensationalize anything. We're going to look at it for what God wants us to look at it for with, uh, um, and the meaning that he wants. Okay, And it's very, very easy to go down a road of, wow, you know what, this could mean this or this could mean that or I'm going to, I'll be the first one when we get to some of these sections. I'm going to say, hey, look, let's read this passage. I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> okay? I don't even want to speculate because I have no clue. There's going to be sections when we're going to do that. And then there's going to be sections where I'm going to say, you know, based on the scripture, we're going to use a lot of hermeneutics, the art and, and uh, science of interpreting scripture. Based on her, the hermeneutics, this looks like what, this is what, what he's trying to tell us here. But... You know, if there's a section that if we come to something that I have no clue, I'm going to let you know, I don't know what this is. I don't, I'm not going to try to make you think that I'm intelligent because most of you know me and that's not going to work. Okay? All right. Another danger is the danger of dogmatism. Dogmatism. What does that mean? Uh, dogmatism is um, um, becoming proud and, and, and divisive. Being dogmatic about something means, hey, I believe that this is what this is and everybody that disagrees with me is wrong. That's dogmatic. That's what the Pharisees did. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says this. 
Now, as touching things offered to idols, we know that we, have, that we have all knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but charity or love edifies. Okay? So we need to be careful about becoming too proud about our knowledge of the Scripture. Okay? We're not going to walk out of this room being um, uh, you know, great mastermind Bible scholars in the book of Revelation and we know every word and every meaning and every, everything and everybody else is peasants. We're not going to do that. We also have to be careful about the danger of escapism. Escapism. A lot of people will read the book of Revelation and they'll say, we better get out while we still can. Okay? There have been movements throughout history where preachers have gotten people to sell all their stuff, go up into a mountain because the rapture is going to happen tomorrow and you want to get the first seat. It sounds bizarre. We're not going to do that. <clears throat> we need to be wise. We need to provide and protect our families. But God has us in this world for a reason. We are in the world, not of the world. There's a reason for that. And it's to make a difference. It's to reach people for Christ. So even with, with our dying breath, we're able to reach people for Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Okay? And the final danger that we have to worry about is pessimism. The danger of pessimism. Uh, we must be full of joy and hope. Okay? We cannot be buried in hopelessness or discouragement because of the things that we're... We're going to be looking at some things here and it's going to be... We're going to think... Oh, wow, that's, is there any hope? We're going to get the sections in this book where we're going to see man after God has revealed to them and given them chance after chance after chance, we're going to be getting to, to sections where man is going to shake his fist at God and say, we know you're there, we know you're doing this, but we won't follow you anyway. And that's going to be, we're going to think, well, what's the point? The point is, as long as you're drawing breath, we give glory to God. We're, we're not going to get into a, oh, this book is so depressed. I don't think the book is depressing. In fact, you know, we got some charts that we'll refer to. We got a seven-year period of tribulation. I believe that seven years of tribulation is God actually reaching out to the remnant, saying, you wanted a sign. I'm going to give you seven years of signs to reach you. Okay, I think that it's God's, it's going to sound weird, but I think the tribulation period is God's grace and mercy to a world lost and dying. Because people have been saying, hey, I, you, you read about that professor who said, you know, if God is real, tell, have him knock this apple out of my hand right here in front of this class. The arrogance and pride of that. To think, you little man, what makes you think that God is going to jump through a hoop for you? To do? But God's going to spend seven. He's going to say, Okay, you wanted a sign, here you go. What are you going to do with it? And some people are still going to shake their fist at God. Okay? So people don't really want a sign. People just want what they want. And God says, no, this is my world. This is about my son, not you. I'm loving you. I'm bringing you a part of my plan. But what you got to understand is God is the central figure and most prominent figure in all the universe. Okay? All right. So, those are some dangers. Here are the solutions to these dangers. Okay? We're going to major on the majors. How many of you ever heard the book, uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff? It's all small stuff. It's a good, it's a good title, at least. Okay? Um, in essence, the book says, Jesus wins. Okay? So, let's start out with that. How many of you would say, um, Jesus wins? Okay, so we're all, all in agreement. So everything from this point on is okay. We're going to disagree on some things. We're going to look at Scripture. But Jesus wins. In the end, he wins. So we're going to have some different views. We're going to have some different opinions. And that's good. God gave us all a three-pound lump of flesh in our skull. We need to use it. And the bottom line is, what's the majors? The majors are God is on the throne. God loves us. God is good. God has given us his word, his truth. Uh, God a way for us to get to heaven. There are some majors that we need to major on. There are a lot of minors that important, vital, nothing in this book is not, but is it, sh should, we, should we use it as a point of division? I don't think so. I don't think so. 
So we're going to major on the majors, which the biggest major is Jesus wins. Okay. Um, number two, uh, um, we're going to better understand opposing views. People, how many of you heard this? People will not care what you know until they know that you care. How many of you heard something like that, right? Well, what's the best way to witness to a Muslim to understand where he's coming from? Know where you come from. Be convicted in, in, in your stance for the word of God, but also understand at least where they're coming from. When I'm with people, I don't do a lot of talking. I do a lot of listening to find out where they're coming from, to care about them. God knows the, the very hairs on their head and then is trying to reach them the least I can do is to find out where they're coming from. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some opposing views. Okay, We're going to look at what we believe Scripture is leaning us toward, but we're going to look at some of the views so that we can understand and better uh, intellectually speak with people on these topics. Another solution to some of these problems, uh, we're going to be able to hold the beliefs in conviction and in love. Okay, Conviction and in love. Um, we got a presidential election coming up. And every time we come up to a presidential election, I think about some of my favorite presidents in history. My favorite, in my, for me, Abraham Lincoln. And there was one statement made about Abraham Lincoln that always pops up in my head whenever I think about a president. Velvet steel. He was called a man of velvet steel. He was firm in his conviction as a steel, firm in his conviction, but it was wrapped in velvet. It was, it was soft in his presentation of it. He was gentle when he was getting that across. He would not bend. He would not break, but he was, he, it was velvet steel. And, and I think that we need to be careful because as Christians, as believers, uh, we, can, we can get to a point where you know, we're, we're beating people over the head with our Bible. Uh, we're literally using it as a sword and we're hitting people. We, we can't do that. We've got to love, but hold to our convictions in love. Uh, I've witnessed the people where they're in my face screaming at me and tried to give a soft answer and a gentle, not bending in my beliefs. I think that's the right way to, to do it. I think that's the way uh, Jesus would want us to do it. Okay? Um, Okay, so another solution here is uh, we will worship the God of Revelation. We will worship the God of Revelation. Uh, if you have all end times knowledge, but it hasn't led you to an increased desire to worship God, you wasted your time. It, let me rephrase that a little bit. If you know everything there is to know about the end times and you don't love God and his people more, we completely wasted our time. This book should draw us closer and closer uh, to our Lord. Here's some certainties. Okay, we're going to uh, go through these relatively quickly. Life as we know it is going to come to an end someday. That is a certainty. There is no way around it. Things are not going to continue forever the way they are. Things are going to change. Okay? Um, another certainty, Jesus is coming again. These are certainties. These are things that you know you, you, uh, you don't, um, um, we, can, we can bank on, so to speak. Okay? More than a quarter of the Bible consists of prophecy. Okay? For every passage or prophecy that talked about Christ's first coming, there are eight that talk about his second coming. So there's eight times as much about what's about to take place than there was about what already took place. Okay? Number three, God will judge all people. He will judge the saved and the unsaved alike. Okay? According to 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to uh, that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So unbelief going to stand before the white throne judgment at the end of time, but believers are going to stand before the judgment seat or the seat of Christ. And that's the judgment seat of rewards, which we'll get to that. Number four, um, um, all will exist forever. Believers will live forever. Unbelievers will exist forever. Okay? Heaven is forever. Hell is forever. 
And we see that in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. We see it in Matthew 24, verse 46, uh, 25, verse 46. And finally, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, because Revelation 21, 1 tells us, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Okay, we are going to, there's our intro. We're going to close in prayer, and, um, and then we'll take uh, a few moments to, to do a little bit of questions and answers. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for who you are. We love you. We cherish you. Lord, I ask that you would continue to help us to grow in our knowledge and love of you. We do love you. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are really glad you were able to join us tonight in our study through the book of Revelation. If you happen to live in the Mars area and like to join us on a Sunday morning, you can come and visit us at 225 Crow Ave, Mars, Pennsylvania. Or you can check us out on the website, www.woodlandvalley.org. But if you live near a local church and you're already plugged in, I would encourage you to continue to do so. And you can use us as a, an additional resource to help you in your study through the scripture.